Lieutenant Tom Hudner, a naval aviator, was reassigned to Rhode Island during the Korean War. Upon entering the locker room, he was met with a noticeable commotion emanating from the restrooms. Ensign Jesse Brown emerged from the restrooms and inquired if Hudner was the transfer. After introductions, Hudner acquainted himself with the members of Fighter Squadron 32, including Carol Mowring, Bo Lavery, Marty Good, and Bill Koenig. The squadron was under the leadership of Lieutenant Commander Dick Savoli. During this meeting, Savoli shared intelligence indicating that Stalin and the Soviets had successfully tested their own bomb, hinting that it wouldn't be long before they deployed it on a bomber. Hudner and Brown were paired by Savoli. While in flight, Brown exhibited a daring approach, disregarding conventional risks and maintaining control in his own unique manner. Hudner shadowed him, adhering to the principle of never leaving a wingman behind. The flying experience was different from what Hudner was accustomed to. Brown even executed a nosedive within a residential area. Interestingly, a woman named Daisy Brown stood in her front yard and waved at them as they pulled up at the last moment. Subsequently, in the locker room, Hudner questioned Brown about the risky maneuver. Brown's response alluded to the idea that a true understanding of a wingman is achieved at higher altitudes. Hudner proposed the idea of grabbing a beer to foster camaraderie, but Brown declined, revealing his abstinence from alcohol. Savoli invited the squadron to his home for a gathering centered around clams. Hudner shared that he had enlisted in the Navy shortly after the events of Pearl Harbor and had graduated soon after the war concluded. An exchange with Lavery hinted at life's unexpected twists, including the presence of a colored aviator in their squadron. Brown's interactions with his wife Daisy demonstrated their affectionate relationship and their shared responsibility for their daughter, Pam. The squadron's focus shifted to preparing for the Russians, as evidenced by the discovery of a reconnaissance plane with bullet holes washed ashore. Their new aircraft, dubbed the Widowmaker, posed unique challenges due to its powerful engine, capable of spinning the plane with the excess throttle or even flipping buildings with its torque. As the pilots acclimated to this aircraft, the news arrived that they were to be deployed. Daisy's encouragement boosted Brown's confidence as he prepared to leave. On his way home, Hudner encountered Brown experiencing car trouble on the roadside and offered him a ride. During the ride, Hudner shared his own calling to adventure and his decision to forego taking over his father's grocery stores. Brown, on the other hand, had always aspired to fly alongside the best pilots, which led him to join the Navy. Upon arriving at the Brown residence, Daisy extended a drink invitation to Hudner, but he graciously declined, recognizing the implied intention. Daisy reminded Brown to be hospitable, unaware of Hudner's true nature. The pilots proceeded to acquaint themselves with the Widowmakers through hands-on drills and training sessions. As they received the news of their imminent deployment, Daisy provided Brown with a boost of confidence before he left their home. On the following day, Brown conceals himself within the confines of a bathroom stall. He lingers there until the entire crowd in the locker room disperses. Gazing at his reflection in the mirror, he engages in a series of self-deprecating remarks. Meanwhile, Hudner finds himself aboard his aircraft, readying for landing. The entire team observes intently as he executes a flawless descent. Subsequently, it's Brown's turn to take the reins. All the African-American crew members stationed on the carrier gather to witness the event. Unfortunately, Brown's flight altitude is too high. Hudner advises him to adjust his nose's position. With guidance from the signal man, Brown manages to correct his altitude but misses the carrier initially. He makes a second attempt, grappling with the mounting pressure, and eventually accomplishes a successful landing. Each member of the team passes their carrier qualifications, with Hudner achieving a perfect score. As their departure date approaches, Savoli instructs them to put their affairs in order before shipping out. Hudner offers Brown a ride back home, and this time, Brown extends an invitation for Hudner to come inside. Daisy warmly receives Hudner, offering him a drink, and implores him to support Brown. Brown relishes a delightful evening with his family at the beach. The subsequent day aboard the carrier, the team engages in a drill, sprinting through hallways, ascending stairs, and reaching their respective aircraft. However, the exercise concludes as a mere simulation, and Savoli expresses the need for improved performance. Although the team returns to their quarters, Brown is singled out for an interview with Life magazine, aiming to provide a positive narrative to alleviate public apprehensions about the possibility of another war. While Brown desires equal treatment as a pilot, the interviewer seeks to focus on the racial perspective. Savoli intervenes, redirecting Brown's attention back to his duties. 
Below deck, a member of the army inquires about Brown's juggling skills. Hudner confronts the individual face to face, yet Brown diffuses the situation by engaging the pilots in conversation. Brown and Hudner agree to discuss the matter later. Hudner's intention was to teach the individual a lesson, whereas Brown opines that their current approach is more favorable. Savoli seeks a volunteer for an undesirable task, and Hudner steps forward, while Brown subtly nudges Moring to take it on. Hudner allows Moring to assume the responsibility, but unfortunately, Moring's attempt ends in tragedy, as the plane crashes into the ocean. The entire team is deeply affected by Moring's loss, but Brown confronts Hudner about his comments concerning Moring's actions. Hudner maintains that following orders is crucial for the pilot's safety. Later, the pilots raise a toast in Moring's memory. In a private conversation between Brown and Hudner, Brown recounts his experiences at the academy. He reveals how he was subjected to unfair treatment, forced to undergo swimming tests repeatedly due to the skepticism surrounding a black man's swimming abilities. Despite enduring challenges such as weighted flight suits, submersion, and icy water, Brown consistently triumphed. He emphasizes that his refusal to conform to expectations saved his life, a lesson he aimed to impart to Moring. Upon docking in Khan, the pilots disembark and explore the surroundings. Brown ventures into a store to find a gift for Daisy, only to stumble upon a gathering of sailors. Investigating further, he discovers that the renowned actress Elizabeth Taylor is among them. A sailor's derogatory remark catches his attention, leading to an invitation from Elizabeth Taylor to attend a casino party later that evening. The pilots make an appearance, but their entry to the French casino is initially denied. Yet, Brown's ability to speak French convinces the staff to reluctantly grant them access. After engaging in dancing and indulging in drinks, they express their gratitude to Elizabeth before moving to a different location. Hudner notices an attractive woman and engages in flirting by showcasing his skill with a magic trick. The soldiers from the carrier, who had a previous encounter with Elizabeth at the casino, appear, leading to a brawl as one of them believes Brown ruined his chances with her. Savoli provides a briefing to the team. Seoul has been captured by North Koreans. There's a concern that if they proceed to seize the remainder of the Southern Peninsula, it might lead to the fall of Japan and an inability of America to contain the spread of communism. The ship embarks on its journey toward Korea. There's a possibility that a significant Chinese force of around 100,000 troops is already present in North Korea. The mission's objective is to destroy two crucial bridges over a major river along the border, with the hope of impeding the Chinese reinforcement efforts. This time, Savoli accompanies the team on the flight. However, it's revealed that Savoli's plane has a mechanical issue with its landing gear. As a result, command authority is transferred to Hudner. The team flies over the target area and encounters hostile fire. While they are unable to fully demolish the bridges, Brown disobeys orders and goes back to complete the task. In Korea, the soldiers on the ground, including the army personnel, endure harsh conditions and await a potential Chinese attack. When the attack ensues, it becomes evident that the odds are not in their favor. Hudner submits his report about the mission to Savoli, providing an accurate account of the events. Brown confronts Hudner about this and highlights the discrepancy in disciplinary consequences for him compared to others. Understanding Brown's predicament, Hudner requests the team to provide their testimonies to vindicate Brown. Hudner catches Brown engaged in a moment of self-reflection in front of a mirror, repeating hurtful directed at him. Hudner assures him that he's managed to secure testimonies from others indicating the complexity of the correct actions. However, Brown recognizes that mere written documents won't alleviate his situation. He asks Hudner to support him by being his ally, foregoing the formalities and diving into the challenge. On the ship's deck, Brown takes a breather and is joined by a fellow crew member of African descent. The crew member acknowledges Brown's recent commendable flying performance and informs him that they pooled their resources to buy him a watch in Khan. The back of the watch is engraved with the phrase, above all others. This gesture deeply moves Brown. On the runway, Brown encounters a friend from his past, whom he affectionately calls Alabama. Alabama is affiliated with the search and rescue unit. Daisy receives a heartfelt letter from Brown. He has hidden her birthday present and left clues for her to uncover it. Following the clues, she discovers a pair of earrings concealed in Pam's closet. The letter concludes with Brown expressing his everlasting love and devotion. Savoli and the team receive a comprehensive briefing. The army is entrenched in a nightmarish battleground. 
The ratio of Chinese forces to Marines is 6 to 1, with extremely cold conditions dropping below minus 30 degrees Celsius at night. The troops are hanging on by a thread, and air support could be instrumental, even though the mission is fraught with danger. On the battlefield, the Marines engage in prayer before taking a step forward as the pilots arrive to provide support from above. They unleash fierce firepower on the enemy, but upon their departure, Hudner notices that Brown's aircraft is leaking fuel. Brown insists it's oil, and he realizes he must bring down the plane gently or risk not surviving much longer. Savoli initiates a search and rescue operation. Brown expends all his missiles to prevent them from falling into enemy hands before making a difficult landing. Brown's motionlessness worries Hudner, who makes the difficult decision to crash land his own plane to be by Brown's side. Despite the objections of fellow pilots, Hudner descends after releasing his own missiles. He rushes to Brown, who is trapped between his seat and the control panel. Both men struggle in vain to free him. Though search and rescue respond to Savoli's distress call, the darkness prevents a landing. Alabama intercepts the communication and offers assistance. Amidst the icy chill, Hudner offers his beanie cap to Brown to provide warmth and tries to extinguish the engine fire using snow. When Alabama arrives, they continue trying to extricate Brown, who remains stuck. Brown's strength wanes, and he implores Hudner to convey his eternal love to Daisy. Hudner uses all his might to strike the plane in a desperate bid to free Brown, but he ceases when he realizes Brown has passed away. Hudner and Alabama leave the scene, with Hudner vowing to return for Brown. Despite his pleas, higher-ups deny Hudner the chance to retrieve Brown's body, and it remains unrecovered. Back on the aircraft carrier, Hudner undergoes a medical examination. Savoli leads a group of pilots on a memorial flight to bid farewell to Brown. Daisy receives a letter from the War Department and is overcome with emotion. As time goes on, she travels to Washington, where President Truman posthumously awards the Medal of Honor to both Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner. Following the ceremony, Hudner confides in Daisy about his apprehension regarding this day. Daisy assures him of her gratitude for his actions and emphasizes that he was there for Brown when it mattered most. Hudner expresses remorse for being unable to save Brown, but Daisy reassures him that it wasn't his responsibility. She wanted him to stand by Brown, and he did just that. The enduring friendship between the Hudner and Brown families continues throughout their lives, and their descendants maintain close ties. The movie ends with Brown reciting his last letters to Daisy. He signs off using his distinctive closing, saying, as always, your dedicated spouse who loves you wholeheartedly, Jesse.